Several months ago, thanks to the efforts of Diane Hamilton, WAVE, and the Social Action Committee, about 10 members of the Meeting House participated in a series of six three-hour classes called Racial Justice Classes for White People. We'll get into why the class was called that later. All of us were quite changed by the experience. Some of the members of the class will be sharing their experience with you this morning. We dedicate this service today to the memory of Trayvon Martin. Our opening words are by Bernice Reagan Johnson of Sweet Honey in the Rock. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of a black man Black mother's son is as important as the killing of a white man. White mother's son, don't you know that we who believe in freedom cannot rest? We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Cannot rest until it comes. Reading this morning will be done by Kitty Cotter. Yeah. <clears throat> when the racial justice classes for white people were offered here at the meeting house, I really didn't want to participate. I thought, I'm not prejudiced, I'm not a racist. However, during the classes, I realized that mere intellectual recognition of racism is only a first step. The classes afforded me an opportunity to examine in depth racism, classism, and white privilege, and to explore with others how I might participate in direct action to combat racism. Recently, I have noticed very subtle changes in my thinking and behavior. I believe the classes deepened my understanding of the all-pervasive nature of racism throughout our culture. In the meditation that follows, please think about how racism has affected your life and the lives of those around you. Thank you. We will now have a period of short reflection followed by the singing of Spirit of Life. During this time, we invite you to ponder some of the questions we considered in our class. What was your family's ethnic background? When you were growing up, did your family socialize with people of other races, other economic classes? What was the first time you became aware of racism? How old were you when you first learned about slavery, about the slaughter of Native Americans, about the Japanese internment camps in World War II? How did these things make you feel? Do you now have close friends who are of another race, another culture, another class? And what actions have you taken or might you take in the future to widen your social circle? Our class was taught by a most wonderful teacher who has been doing this kind of work since the mid-70s, and she is amazing. We're delighted that she's here with us today. Please say hello to Tia Cross.
<laughs> when we decided to do this service today, Tia suggested a few questions for us. Why did you take the class? What did you expect? What did you get from it? What was your understanding of why the first classes were for white people only? Was the class useful to you? Here's Diane Hamilton to lead us off. Good morning, everyone. In May of 2011, after a hiatus of many years, we created the Social Action Committee at the UU Meeting House, and we began to look at issues in our meeting house, our community, Cape Cod, and beyond. One of the issues we wanted to work on was racism. And so a subgroup was formed that included Wave and myself, and with the help of Reverend Kate and the Social Action Committee. In the course of researching how to proceed, I met a woman at a Habitat for Humanity construction site, and she suggested we get in touch with Tia Cross, who had been teaching racial justice classes since the 1970s. In talking with Tia, and she was very dynamic and wonderful to talk with, and she really enrolled me immediately, she suggested a racial justice class for white people. She explained that white people needed to learn to work together on their own understanding and awareness around racism, classism, and white privilege, much like men needed to learn to work together on their sexism. And so we offered a series of six racial justice classes for white people with Tia thoughtfully and masterfully guiding us. Through group discussion and partner work, we were challenged to make the journey through our lives, recalling and realizing how racism, classism, and white privilege negatively affected our families, our friends, and our communities. In looking at my life, I came up with a few, and I'll mention just a few. Um, I came up with a lot, actually, but I'll mention just a few today. I remembered in sixth grade how the teacher who was white targeted the young black males and made their lives hell for an entire year. I remembered the Brandywine Music Box Theater in the 50s where I worked my first job as an usher up with other young girls all white, I may add. And when the all-black cast of the musical Jamaica came through, we were told we were not allowed to talk with them. I shared how my partner and I were driving on Route 80 in Pennsylvania last year and passed a frightening billboard that asked, where is the real birth certificate? Referring to President Obama. And the class allowed me to express and examine a re recent prejudicial thought I had and to move forward in a constructive rather than guilt-producing path. In the class, our instructor Tia brought relevant film, films and gave out informative literature. And one of the written pre pieces entitled White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. Peggy listed daily effects of white privilege in her life. In this list, she came to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that she can count on cashing in each day, but about which she was meant to remain oblivious. A few on the list. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. Another, I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. And another, I can remain oblivious of the language and customs of people of color without feeling in my culture 
any penalty for such oblivion. She went on to list 44 more examples. I was familiar with the concept of white privilege, although I really didn't think about it a lot when I think about it. But these specific examples brought home just how much I benefit from being simply white. It was a privilege to make this journey with others in the class. In our sharing about racism, I learned from their lives, their pain, their understandings, as well as my own. Thank you to all my workshop participants and thank you to your cross. I now view my life, my thoughts, my community, and my country with more scrutiny when it comes to racism, and I keep learning and being more aware. It is very empowering. In continuing this conversation at the Meeting House, we hope to offer more racial justice classes for white people. We also plan to initiate an ongoing racial justice dialogue in a multicultural setting, as well as specific activities that bring together and celebrate diverse groups within our community. We ask you to join us. Thank you. Why did I take the racial justice class for white people? I had heard about this curriculum for something like 20 years since I lived in the Germantown section of Philadelphia where I attended a church that was on the cutting edge of human rights, economic justice, and racial equality issues. The class never seemed to fit into my schedule, so it came and passed many, many times. We've all had that experience of wanting to do something but not quite fitting into our schedule. I must admit there was a small part of me that felt maybe there's a secret bullet, a magic benign weapon that would emerge as the answer for whites like me who felt powerless and mystified as to how we could begin to make changes in our communities, heck, in our very lives, so that the visceral tensions and divisions I felt as a white minority in a black majority neighborhood would somehow begin to heal. I grew up in the 60s and 70s in suburban Long Island in Freeport, a community of 40,000, which was 25% black and Hispanic. We had neighbors who were black, yet I knew that just a half mile away from our neighborhood, it was practically all people of color and all low income. Disparity became obvious to me, painfully obvious, when I moved to Germantown in 1990 from all-white Scranton, Pennsylvania, I had never lived within and among such disparity in my life. It was shocking. I would ride the bus or the subway home from work, wondering how in the world do the 80% of the folks I sat with manage to live and cope in these rundown neighborhoods with little or no services, decent grocery stores, etc. Yes, I always knew that there was an advantage to growing up white in this nation. I hated the word privilege as it brought to mind ivy-colored walls of golf courses with high privet hedges. But was I privileged? Not like the elite country club set, but was I privileged, I was privileged to have two parents who had the means to buy a little tiny house in 1959. They could qualify for a mortgage, no problem. As my own awareness increased, there are lots of advantages that I would grow to feel awkward about, yet did not have a sense of how little old me could make a difference in the world ruled by inequality and injustice. Like my Depression-era parents, I also learned the art of living frugally. But still, this feeling of why do some have it all, while others don't, nod at my altruistic nature to do something. I also took the class because I knew some of the people who were attending. 
It was a unique opportunity to get to know people better and deepen these friendships. And I also felt that the UU Meeting House would be a dynamite resource of knowledge, thanks to Tia, and the solution building to this problem. How could I go wrong? Why attend an all-white class on this topic? Because I knew that there were things and feelings that were best first said in an all-white group with a leader who knew what would be coming up for most of us. I knew that step one was putting it all out there and then seeing what steps would come after in terms of meeting with people of color and beginning a dialogue together. And just in case you were wondering, there is no magic bullet solution. Rather, the ongoing self-awareness and self-education, that dialogue, so that dialogue can open up doors and build bridges. Thank you. And now I'll hand it off to Wave. Good morning. Uh, the first time that I heard the term white privilege was 1999, and it was in the context of an invitation at Hope Community Church in Amherst by someone white in the congregation. It caught me off guard. Why was I being asked to participate in something that was all white? Why would I want to? Um, and what was it maybe implying? Initially, I didn't understand. Even with the congregation at Hope being diversely populated, the leadership team and half the congregation continuously experienced a lot of privilege being exercised. So they encouraged the whites to explore white privilege while the people of color explored internalized racism as a spiritual practice. Through this body of work, I was able to zero in on attitudes in myself that expressed a superiority. Often the same attitudes about race, gender, and sexuality that progress to behaviors that I reject. I realized how constructs around race, in particular, limited my interactions in most groups for a span of 20 to 40 years, if I include my childhood. In this workshop with Tia, I reflected on an event in the early 60s at the eight, at, where at the age of five, my family had moved to a different neighborhood, leaving behind my best friend. Our move was termed white flight, the migration of whites away from the issues that surface when racially diverse neighborhoods systematically began to receive fewer local governmental services than the predominantly white neighborhoods. I'll never fully know what it is like to walk in anyone else's shoes, but I can relate to some degree by keeping close to my heart the psychological, emotional, and physical grief and pain that I have experienced as a sissy, as a faggot, as a blue collar worker, and then a pink collar professional. Here locally on the Outer Cape, there are cliques. And nationally, there are hate groups that do not celebrate my life or treat me equal. Being in this recent workshop with members of our congregation lifts my spirits in ways that words can only barely express. There's renewal that comes from the witnessing of each other's willingness to share stories and our truths. Good reasons. We are willing to address our assumptions and seek the truth. I'm happy and healthier for doing this work, and hopefully, since 1999, I've made others happy along the way by not imposing myself all over the place and helping to create safe space for all. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Apt, and those of you who are really familiar with me know that I normally don't listen to sermons. Um, I know, I know, it's crazy. But uh, I really do believe that actions speak louder than words. And uh, so anyway, I tried to put a short little thing together. And excuse me if uh, I get lost. Uh, I, I usually tend to like the free associate, and this is uh, going to keep me organized. Um, I joined this workshop for a really good reason. 
I deeply admire, love, and respect Diane Hamilton. Um, I wanted to support Diane, and I wanted to support the Social Justice Committee because I think that their actions speak louder than any words could ever. Um, so uh, I made a phone call to Diane and I joined the group. I attended the workshop and I'm going to reflect just a little bit about what I thought. In the 70s, during my high school experience, I definitely joined every group when there were racial problems in the school. I was sitting in that English teacher's classroom talking about what the problems were, trying to make a difference. So that was my 70s experience. Um, in the 80s, I joined the National Organization for Women. I was an active member of the Montgomery County National Organization and went to every workshop I could get to in order to try to deepen my own experience. Um, by the 90s, I was attending racism workshops through the Massachusetts Teachers Organization learning everything that I could so that the next generation of children who I happen to have the privilege of being in their lives, that they would see me as a whole person and know that no matter who they were, I accepted them for what they were, who they were, what they believed, regardless of race, class, who their parents were, what was happening in their own lives. So when the opportunity for this workshop came, and because I love this woman, she is love, I said, okay. Um, so this was going to be my 21st century experience. Um, the workshop required honesty, it required trust, and every session each of us was reminded to stay open, and only share what we were comfortable with. And there were some sharings that were quite uncomfortable. And I truly admire this group of people for being that honest with me. Because it would be so easy just to keep that to yourself and not share. Um, I learned the history. You know, slavery just didn't start when the pilgrims came to America. I learned that Slavery has been happening since the pyramids were being built. People were always being oppressed. People were always looking for those people to do free work for them. It was only here in the United States. How crazy, the greatest country, I think the greatest country, that those people decided, those people, some people, decided they needed free labor in order to make more money. And that free labor happened here in the United States to involve a culture of people whose skin are different than ours. How crazy. I was floored. And it, it made me think about slavery through the ages and the people who have been oppressed. But only here in the United States did color take that, that color took us to another level. I was horrified. Um, so what I learned in those six weeks was really profound for me. I am deeply committed to ending racism in my own part of the world. I will work till the day I die in my little part of the world. Um, I'll keep my eyes open. I will speak up against injustices, large and small. I will be the change that I want to see. Uh, I'm committed to these people, I'm committed to my congregation, and uh, Tia, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to end by saying that uh, it's, not, it's not an easy journey, I always have that little, like when I was going to get up and read this today, I thought, oh, it's not good enough. <laughs> oh, Mary, you know, come on, who are you? But I forced myself to come and, and share with you. And I, I would like to end with a quote from Margaret Mead, and she said that you should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has.
I agreed to take the racial justice classes with trepidation, a little resentful that I was giving up three hours of my Friday evening for six weeks. But less than halfway through the first session, I realized this commitment was going to be well worth the inconvenience. My eyes were opened to many things, from the long history of racism in our country to the most personal revelation, racism and classism that I had been holding on to. An enlightening exercise during the classes involved reflecting on our past as we were growing up, what our family's attitudes were about issues such as racism, classism, and money. I found this especially enlightening. Having been raised in Memphis, Tennessee in the 60s, during the time of the garbage collector's strike and Martin Luther King's assassination, I began to examine what that felt like for me. My father had a small diner in downtown Memphis where I worked from the age of 12. His business was only blocks from where Reverend King was killed. Once the rioting stopped and the nightly curfews were lifted, white flight to the suburbs began almost immediately. I remember hearing my parents and their customers despair at what was happening to their city and why. How the city was being taken over and things would never be the same as more and more downtown businesses closed their doors or moved out east. As I look back on this time in my life, what I noticed was how different my view of the situation was from my parents. When I would hear statements like, who do they think they are? They just want to have more babies so they can get more welfare money. Why didn't I buy into it like so many others my age? As I remembered that time, I was reminded, even at the age of 11, when Reverend King was killed in Memphis, I knew what it was like to be an outsider. My way of walking and talking that was a little too sissy kept me from, becoming, from making many friends, and I often found myself the brunt of jokes. So I guess it was no wonder that I found it easier to identify with those fighting for equality than with my family and neighbors who were determined to protect the status quo with a white man firmly in charge. Now this is not to say that I didn't uncover racist and classist attitudes during the classes with Tia. Through these classes, I began to uncover the layers of racism and classism that do still exist in me and to start the work on peeling them away. For instance, why is it that I'm much more inclined to give a stranger in the stop and shop a friendly greeting if he's white, but look the other way if it's a person of color? I believe we all must continue to examine ourselves, learn about and fight racism, and stand up for the equal rights of all people today. Thank you. As you can tell, taking this class was a powerful experience for all of us. We invite you to do something that Tia asked us to do every week. As you go about your daily life, start to look for examples of race and class differences around you, at the grocery store, on the street, in the newspaper, on the internet, on television. Some incidents will be quite glaring and many more will be much more subtle. If you're a person of color or you're poor, you've been doing this your whole life. If you're white, you may begin to see how, quick, how frequently these things are occurring around you. With that consciousness, we can then begin to change ourselves and change the world around us.